Amen. Good morning, church. It's good to be back. I've been traveling for the last three weeks um, for work. The last time um, I was up here, we looked at how God has been uh, incredibly crossing his arms concerning us. And I sure hope since then, uh, you've seen several ways that God has continued to cross his arms concerning you. It's good to see Guy and Ellie this morning. Um, you know, two weeks ago, uh, there was a celebration of life for our sister Kathy in Toronto. And um, it's one of the, I would say, and I'm not saying it's because you're here, <laughs> okay? It's probably the best celebration of life event that uh, my wife and I ever witnessed. You know, um, our sister taught many how to live life. And by example, you know, watching that event and the ceremony, you looked forward to heaven. You know, after we left, I mean, Ellie was uh, looking at her. I mean, a lot of us came in emotional. I mean, the crowd was incredible. Like 600 people in the, in the auditorium. It was, it was a real celebration. But if you, I mean, I can't describe it. If you haven't seen it, I think a guy posted a video. Um, I encourage you to see that video, everything from start to finish. Just amazing. Amazing, the stage and everything. And we got home, and that evening we hosted some friends. And a friend of ours visiting from Nigeria, we finished high school together. And I hadn't seen him, in, seen him in 35 years. He was in town. Um, now I know I'm dating myself now. That's okay. But, you know, he looked at the program. We had the program of the event, and he went through the program, and he was just going through the pictures and the story. And he said, can I take this with me, please? And I said, sure, take it. Because we had a, an extra copy that we left. I so, brother, Ellie and your brothers, we're really proud of you. Thank you for the example, and thank you for giving a lot of us the opportunity to witness, you know, the, the, the great example that your wife lived. And uh, we continue to pray for you and for the weakness, strength and weakness ministry. Amen? Amen. Um, as we gather this morning, oh, um, I've been thinking, it's been a, Wonderful summer, and I know last week, I don't know about you, last week or week before, the weather started to drop, temperature started to drop, and somebody said, oh, hey, summer is ended. I'm like, no, summer is not ended yet for me, you know, um, and as, you know, this week came up, the weather was warming up, and I thought about what message I was going to preach today about, what topic I would choose, you know, and summer is the most exciting time in Canada. You know, people are happier, people are more friendly. You know, you take somebody else's sport, parking sport, they're like, okay, they'll find another one, you know. But when it comes to winter, it's, it's different. You know, I'm from Africa. I was born in a tropical country. And I was shocked the first time when somebody came in, you know, I walked, walked in, the, in the branch of the bank years ago, and somebody came in and was crossing under his breath in the winter. He was, I hear this word, I'm like, you were born here. How do you hate it? What about me? What should I say? <laughs> you know, winter, it's, you know, people are not happy. People, are, the moods change. So I thought, you know, what way can we encourage ourselves as to prepare? Because the reality is, it's inevitable. It's coming. And it's going to come. You no know, matter what you do, right? It's going to come. So we prepare ourselves. And uh, this morning I thought, what best way to look at um, our preparation for the beautiful uh, fall, as the temperatures fall, uh, this, the trees uh, change colors, and we prepare for that uh, big time of the year. You know, as a dog came up this morning to open and he used Matthew 6, 25, believe it or not, he and I never spoke. He had no idea what I was going to talk about. And this convinced me more that the Spirit of God is at work here. Amen? Um, I, I told you my message today, worry the spice of life. I don't know about you. I like spices. And uh, if you're from my part of the world, 
spice is good. You know, you get, you know, if you give me food and it's not hot enough, my wife actually, anytime we go to a restaurant, she has in her purse a small bottle. Like, it's not hot enough. You know, you bring, uh, whatever you bring is like ketchup to my wife. If you say, I want hot spice, I'm like, nah. She brings out her stuff. And just yesterday, I was in the mall to get her some really hot stuff. You know, um, so as I talk about worry, you know, many things come to mind. I think about worry. You think about anxiety, you think about fear, you know, you think about troubles. These are all things that come together. You know, last week, um, our brother speak, uh, Chris spoke about commitment, you know, the need for us to be committed to God. And, you know, and I know a lot of us are genuinely interested in being committed. A lot of us want to be committed. But a lot of times, we're constrained by the worries and the troubles and the challenges that hold us down. We want to come to midweek service. We're physically tired. We're also emotionally tired. We're worn out. We're going through tough times. And we just decide, you know what? I'm just going to take some time and rest. You know, and as I examined this, I thought, this morning, it's important that we help ourselves look at some tips and some tricks on how we can minimize. We cannot eliminate. I don't know if you can ever, anybody can ever eliminate fears or troubles or worries or anxiety, but at least minimize those in our lives. You know, every single day we deal with anxiety and at every single stage of our lives. As a student, you're worried about getting good grades and passing your exams so that you can get to university. And then you get to university, you're concerned about graduating. You can't wait to leave university and just go into that beautiful world and make money, right? And you get into the world and you start to work and you find out, that, wow, it's different here. It's tough. I get home. I have to go to McDonald's. I have to go to KFC. Now I have to get married. I just want to get married so that somebody can help me and prepare some meals for me, right? Then you get married. And you go, oh, life is good. You go on honeymoon. This is the best thing to happen to me. And then, oh, it starts. And I go, oh, my goodness. Okay, you know what? I think we should have children. Maybe if we have children, things will be okay. Right? And then you have children. And then you find out that parenting is at a different level entirely. You know, you want your wife's attention. Your wife is busy with the kids. And you're grumpy, right, as a man. And then you're like, okay, what am I going to do? I can't wait for these kids to go. If you're lucky, they grow, they leave. If you're unlucky, they leave, they come back. <laughs> and they took over the basement, right? What do you do? You can do nothing, right? And now you are start negotiating with them to help you with the bills. And then, you know, finally they go. You're looking forward to being an empty nester. You're looking forward to just retiring in peace, right? And enjoying your retirement. Then you start looking at your pension balance and your RSP and you don't have enough. And you start to stress out again. You know, so it's a cycle that never ends. You know, um, some stages in our lives are smoother than others. Some days are better than others. But I'm convinced that God uses stress, worry, fear, and anxiety as a tool to show us that we're made for heaven. No matter how beautiful it is here, every heaven is the ultimate destination. And he uses those things to draw us closer to him so that we can grow in our faith, we can learn how to trust in him, and we can learn how to walk in strength in him. Amen? Now, before I continue, is there anybody here who doesn't have any kind of trouble, any kind of worry, any kind of stress, any kind of anxiety in their lives? Anyone? Okay, so you can, you can leave. Leave, and then the rest of us can stay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Come back. <laughs> Anyway, um, what is anxiety? 
I have, uh, I try to look up the uh, a definition of anxiety. You have it there. Anxiety is defined as a psychological and physiological state of arousal caused by the brain's interpretation of stimulus as a threat. Now, I know this is big grammar. You know, there's a threat, there's a stimulus, something that creates some excitement. Let me give you an example. You know, you get an invitation for a party. Let's say, you know, the women here, you get somebody's invited to, to a party. And there's a thrill, there's an excitement that you're going to go to a party. Okay? What happens next? You start thinking of what to wear. <laughs> what should I wear? And then all of a sudden, the thrill of the party becomes anxiety. It becomes stressful. I don't know about you, but several times in the morning, I dress for work. And I'm good. And I have this long mirror behind the door of my room. And I look at myself like, okay, I look great today. And then sometimes I go, no, this shoe doesn't uh, match this suit. Then I change it. Then I go back, uh, you know, it's brown. I have a dark suit. And then I use the next 10 minutes trying to decide which shoe. I don't know. Does anybody else go through that? Yeah? Okay, brothers, sisters, amen. You know, that's what um, st stress does. You know, the combination of thrills and threats. Um, in a week and a half, I'll be traveling back to Nigeria. I'm taking my vacation finally. I'm going on a three weeks vacation. And it's so exciting. Like, enter my job, people, I'm going, and people go, hey, man, you're going home. Are you excited? And I go, ah, I don't know. Donna is shaking her head, right? I'm from Nigeria. I love my country. My family is back there. But I tell you, it's always stressful going back to Nigeria. I, I got to be honest with you. I confess here. You know, I spent two weeks in Nigeria, and on my way back, I spent one week in London, England, because I have family there. The two weeks in Nigeria is pretty stressful. I use a one week in London for my vacation to recover <laughs> before I come back. Because, you know, there's so much excitement going on. I got family from everywhere. I got to go to two cities, and everybody wants you to see them. And then in Lagos alone, Lagos is the main city. It's like our Toronto. has a population of about 22 million people. That's more than half of the population of Canada. If I travel from my office downtown to Canada, it takes me about 20, 25 minutes. The same distance in Lagos is minimum four hours. No word of life. If you know anybody from Nigeria, it's Fumi Obando here. Ask anyone, they'll tell you. It's stressful. So when I go, I stay in my family house, which is in the middle of the city. And I let everybody know I'm in town. You want to see me? This is where we're going to meet. <laughs> everybody comes there. I spend the whole day there. And that's it. And I go back to the island and I, I do my thing. You know, so pray for me, please, brothers and sisters. Um, I have a few things that I have up here this morning um, as common stress factors, things that stress us. And I don't know about you, some triggers. You know, um, frequent lateness. I don't know about you, but, you know, my wife is very disciplined. My wife is from a military family. You know, we're going to church, we have to leave exactly at 10 so that we can get to service by 10 20. at 10 o'clock you're not ready my wife is sitting in the car she's just going to sit there and you're going to feel so guilty <laughs> that you know you're going to run to the car with your shoes <laughs> you know and and the kids just you know you know do the hair and all that you know it freaks people out it freaks some people out it stresses some people you know in africa we have something called african time the Caribbeans have it as well. You know, the Indians have something called IST, Indian Standard Time. If you're invited to a party at 7 o'clock, and the first time we did it, you know, the Nigerian was having a big party in Toronto, and I didn't realize it. At 7 o'clock, my wife and I were rushing, and we got there at 7.15, and I was so stressed up. I was upset. We were late. And we got into the hall. There were just two people in the hall. And I had to ask one of the guys, is this a place for the party? I said, yeah. I just, yeah. <laughs> and, then by nine, and I was upset. I was, and then by 8 o'clock, people started strolling in. 9 o'clock, people walking. 
And at 10 o'clock, the celebrants started dancing in at 10 o'clock. I was starving. I was hungry. I was grumpy because we didn't have dinner. I'm like, I was hoping to have dinner at this party. And after that, I said to my wife, no more African parties for me. <laughs> you know, uh, like this. Constant anger and, and, and frustration. You know, you get angry. Um, when, I, when I showed you the definition earlier, there's a relationship between the psychological and the physiological, right? And they're all interconnected, interwoven. If stress comes as a result of any of this, when you're just angry, it has a physical impact on you, yeah. right? Frustration, inability to do something. You can't do it, you just get frustrated and you get stressed out. Money. Lack of money or too much money. It can stress you out. You hear stories of people who won the lottery and ended up being broke, right? Uh, you know, being burnt out, overextended. The death, you know, of... Um, close relative or a friend. Forgetfulness. Some people just forget things and it stresses them out. It's just the fact that they don't remember. Right? So I have to constantly, as you get older, you find out that you have to find ways. I constantly use my phone and just put it in my phone. You know, the breakdown of a relationship. Losing contact with loved ones. You know, injury. Illness. Abuse. Loss of job or the fear of loss of job. Um, unforeseen circumstances. Sometimes nothing. Just stresses some people out. You ask me, why are you stressed out? Nothing. Just stressed out. <laughs> or some have a long to do list. You know, you make a long to do list and you're just stressed out about, oh, I have to do all this stuff. Sometimes overthinking, indecision, right? Thinking I'm traveling, what am I going to pack? Should I pack this? Should I pack that? Do I take this? Sometimes I've left, you know, walked out of the door, and I changed my mind. No, I think I used the wrong bag. I go back, change the bag. You have so much. Sometimes I find myself in that situation. Um, so as we go through all these, let's examine. This. We're going to go back to Matthew chapter 6 again. You know, um, the scripture that our brother read this morning. And I'm not going to read it all out. You know, this is Jesus, you know, um, preaching on the mount. And he just reminds us about the need not to worry. Not to worry about our life. About what we eat. About what we drink. You know, and he compares us to the birds of the air. Now, if you remember in Genesis, last time here we talked about Genesis and how God created everything and everything was good. And when he created man, he said it was very good. So we're above every other thing and God put us in charge. Right? God compares us to the birds. He says, look at the birds. Some of you have birds as pets. Look at the birds. I don't care. Some of you have... Uh, Another example is a dog. Some of you have pets. You have dogs, right? Anybody has dogs as pets here? Yeah? They're cool. I love dogs. But the dogs that I play with are those ones this size. You know, I don't come near the big ones. And you wonder, why not? Well, if you're from my part of the world, you know dogs are vicious. <laughs> They're not pets in Africa. <laughs> they don't live in the house. <laughs> no, 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 no. They eat anything and everything. And then you release them, you let them lose at night to stay in the compound. And when they bark, the thief stays away. You know? So, God says we're more valuable than every other thing. And yet, he looks after them. So, we worry. What value does worry add to your life? Says, no matter how much you worry about the tasks that you haven't completed, you can never add one more hour, not even one minute. A day will always have 24 hours. 
You know? So why do you worry when worrying will not make any difference? You know, and you say, maybe you're sitting here and you're saying, well, Kunle, you don't understand my situation. If you do understand my situation, you will know that worry has to be part of my life every day. That's true. I don't understand your situation. But Jesus understands your situation. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, in verse 13, I don't have that on here, but I'm going to read it if you have your Bible so that we can all go back to our Bibles, amen? And I'm going to read... Yes, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. He says, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, you also provide a way out so that you can stand up on day. You know, what is this saying? There's nothing new under the sun. There's nothing that we go through in life that somebody else has never gone through. Nothing. You know, and the Bible says God is faithful. God is faithful. He will not give you more than you can handle. And he says, even if, even if, he will also provide a way out. So think about that. If he's going to do that, then why does it make you and I go through trials and tough times and challenges? Because knowing you and I very well, we're very smart. We always have answers to everything. We always find solutions to everything, right? We can create, you can go to the space. We create an aircraft. We can make it fly. But knowing you and I, God wants us to trust and come to him all the time and to put our faith in him. And you say, well, I pray to God. He doesn't answer my prayer sometimes, or he doesn't even do what I ask him to do. That's true. Maybe you've prayed for something and you're not getting what you've prayed for. Those of you who've done economics and you teach your kids, there's a difference between a want and a need. Sometimes we go to God and we ask for something because we believe that's what we want. And God looks at us and God says, my child, that's not what you need. I will give you what you need and not what you want. You know, my friend has a, a little dog, beautiful dog called uh, Enzo. Enzo is this size, a chihuahua, very beautiful dog. And anytime I walk into my friend's office, my friend owns a business, Enzo comes to the office every day. You know, he drives Enzo to the office. Enzo has a corner. There's a couch in my friend's office. And, you know, if you want to lose your job, you'll be mean to Enzo. You're gone. Like, he will fire you right away. There was a time he actually booked a trip to go to Florida with his family and uh, his in-laws. And, and there was a rule on that flight about pets. He had to put it in the crate and say he didn't want. So he had to put Enzo in business class. And he put his wife and the kids in economy. And as soon as he was booked, he called me. He said, Kunle, I need your help. I said, what? He said, I don't know how to explain this to my wife when I get home. Because I'm flying into a business class. Everybody else is flying in the economy, right? So anytime I visit their home, and we're with Enzo. And Enzo will run to me because there's a particular part of the house where they put, they put um, uh, the treats for Enzo. And I like to bribe Enzo. Like, I like Enzo to come to me. So I will go and grab a treat, and I'll give Enzo. And if you have a dog, they're never tired of treats, right? You keep giving them treats, you keep them giving them treats, you know. So I would give Enzo, and Enzo would come to me. And then it was Enzo's birthday, and my friend said he was going to buy, um, what's it called, Wendy's. He was going to get a meal from Wendy's as a treat 
for Enzo. And his wife warned him. You know, if you're married, listen to your wife. His wife warned him, and so he bought this from Enzo, and uh, it, the bill eventually came to close to $3,000 to save Enzo's life. All right? So Enzo wanted it. That's what Enzo wanted. He wanted to have that treat. And Enzo didn't say no. He ate everything that was given to him. That's the same thing with us. What we want sometimes can be harmful to us. And so if God doesn't answer that particular prayer or the exact way we want it, it's not because God doesn't love us. It's because God believes that is not what we need at a time. So as we keep talking about the challenges, worries, I have a few practical tips I'd like to kind of share with us this morning. Um, I'm not a psychologist by any means, but I hope that some of these tips, you know, can, can help us. Um, one of the ways to look at dealing with stress and pressure in our lives is what I call processing forward. Again, we're going to go into the Bible, to the book of Psalms. Amen? In Psalm 53, sorry, Psalm 56, verse 3 to 4, it says, are we there? It says, when I am afraid, I will trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust. I will not be afraid. What can mortal man do to me? You know, this is uh, David, you know, when David was seized by the Philistines in Gath. And, you know, this is a tough situation to be in. His enemies have captured him. And it's a very fearful thing to be in the hands of your enemies. And David is looking around and saying, God, when I'm afraid, there's no way I can turn to but to you. And for us as Christians, the only place we can turn to when we're confronted by fear is God. You know, process forward. And part of doing that, and this is what the experts have said, is to try and have a journal. You know, journal the things that bring you fear and anxiety. Write them down. Write them down and then pray specifically about those. Ask somebody to help you as well. Because the more you write them down, the more you remember and the more you're not flustered. Amen? Second thing here is developing new habits and self-care. You know, I said earlier on, there's a connection between the psychological and the physiological, uh, the physical. Uh, can you help me bring up that label? You can find it? Okay, that's right. So I, I wanted to bring up something here. You know, as a matter of habit, Several years ago, I never used to have breakfast, and my weight was a challenge. And my doctor kept saying, you got to, you know, add some weight. And I know I don't look it. If I tell you I weigh 155 pounds, you go, why are you too skinny? You look too tiny. But I had to pump it up. I started to have, I never used to have breakfast. And so I wanted to do something that would make life a lot easier for me that I would enjoy. So over the last, I would say, seven, eight years, I've been having constant constant breakfast. Every morning I'll have my toast, you know, and I wanted to make it easy. So white slices, you know, sliced bread, white, soft, very soft, easy to go in the mouth, two boiled eggs, and my glass of orange juice, right? And so, you know, wash it down with nice glass of orange juice. And I wanted something healthy. So when I go to the store, I will buy the one that says, not from concentrate. Yeah, I don't know if you know the difference between concentrate and not concentrate. It's the you know the production, you know, the not concentrate, you know, the you know the, the factory, whatever it is, they would extract the water 
and they pasteurize it, and after they're done, ready to store it, they put the water back and all that. And so, you know, I go for the non-concentrate, concentrate, which is usually more expensive. I say, you know what, yeah, you know, I, I buy it. So every morning, a glass of juice, seven days a week, three, six, five days a year. Well, I, last year when I did my medical checkup, the nutritionist said to me, you know, you know, so you journal what you have for breakfast, lunch, lunch, and dinner. And she looked at it and goes, you need to slow down on the orange juice. You know, I was like, yeah, it's, it's not concentrated. It's beautiful. It's, you know, she goes, yeah. I said, have the orange instead. I'm like, how do I have breakfast, bread, egg? I got to wash it down. How do I orange? It's, it's not easy. It doesn't go well, right? And so as I got more information, and we sat down in our office, and she put down a glass. Okay, in front of me. And she said, if I put water in this glass, how many teaspoons of sugar will you put? I said, two. Right? How many of you will put two? One. How many will put three? Help me here, guys. Two? Okay, how many will put one? How many will put two? How many of you will put three? How many, will put, how many of you will put four? Awesome. How many will put five? Six. We've got to talk after this, brother. How many will put seven spoons of sugar in the glass? Okay. Seven. Eight. What, do you know? So I said two. She said no. So she brought out sugar and a teaspoon. And she started to put one, two, three. And we got to eight. And I go, and it was almost half full, the glass. And she said, if I put water in this, will you drink it? I said, no way. So, well, that's what you consume every morning. Because in that orange juice, each glass, the sugar, okay, is 31 grams of sugar. Each teaspoon is four grams of sugar. So divide, I do the maths, 32 divided by four, that gives you eight. So that's what you put in your system every morning. Plus, the bread, the white bread. The carb in the white bread is higher than any other type. So take that Five grams will make, um, no, f yes, five grams will be one teaspoon of carb. Convert that as well. I got home, the remaining orange juice that I had in my fridge, I emptied it into the sink. Done. You know, because as you grow older, your body is no longer the same. I'm 52. And I know, yeah, thank you, you don't believe it, right? Yeah. It feels good. I'm 52. You know, the things that I used to put in my body when I was 18, I can't put them in my body anymore. Those of us who still remember the, this race we had the other day, you know, we had to do 100 meters, right, out there without warming up. And I'm still seeing my physio because I pulled something, right? Your body is not the same anymore, you know? So you've got to develop new habits. You've got to self-care. You know, if you've not been exercising, exercise is very important. You know, exercise actually empties your brain. It helps free your mind. And to the brothers who are here, I encourage you men, take exercise very seriously. Yesterday I went out for my one hour run. And if I met 10 people that were jogging or riding bikes, eight of them were women. Maybe two men. And I'm like, where are all the guys? Sleeping? <laughs> Doing what? <laughs> Guys, change a habit. Do not take on too much. You know, there's some of us who are people pleasers. You know, we want to do everything. You know, learn to time block in terms of what you want to do and having a time that you're going to set aside. And set limits. You know, set limits. Today, social media is taking a lot of our time, and we don't realize it. You know, you take up your phone, 
I wonder how many apps I have on this thing. You know, several years ago when I had, I don't know if, if you remember those flip phones. I used to work for RBC. The latest one was called Razor, Motorola Razor. That was what I had. You open it up, you know, and then in 2007, 2008, they gave us new phones. And those of us who were in the sales, and go, you need to have this thing called BlackBerry. And then you got BlackBerry, and then you, you had to call the tech department to activate it. And I called to activate mine, and the guy goes, have you ever used a BlackBerry? I said, no. He said, welcome to BlackBerry, my friend. Your life will never be the same again. Since 2008, my life has never been the same with this thing. Because there's so much taking for our time. You know, you have Facebook, you have LinkedIn, you have, help me, Twitter, you have Instagram, you have, like, so much of these, and the brain is, you know, keeps working. The brain keeps working, right? And the phone is there and keeps telling you, pick me, right? Because it beeps, pick me, and then you grab it again, and then you're on. Pick me, and then you keep going. It's a lot of time waster, right? Set your limits. If you watch TV, these days, my wife, my wife doesn't watch TV. She doesn't watch news on TV. She doesn't. Because what do you see on TV with the news? Three quarters of what you have on news is negative news. Right? Negative news that they're trying to sell. If you're going to watch TV, of course it's good to watch and know what's going on in the world. Do it in the afternoon. Don't watch news and late news and bad news late at night before you sleep. You know, some of you are good at watching horror movies. Awesome. Don't watch horror movies at night, please. You know, it has an impact on our brains. Establish support systems. You know, turn your Bibles with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Establish support systems. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, from verse 11, this is Paul talking to the brothers and sisters in the church in Corinth. In verse 11, it says, We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and opened wide our hearts to you. We're not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. As a fair exchange, I speak as to my children, open wide your hearts also. You know, to be able to get help, we have to be open. You know, and in getting your support system, determine what that will be. You know, it could be people, friends, family, brothers and sisters in the church. People who have had your kind of trouble and who have gone through it. Reach out to them to help. But you have to be open. Because people wouldn't know what you're going through if you don't speak about it. And that's what Paul is encouraging. Open wide your heart. Speak, talk to us, trust me. And I know, you know, it's a, it's a world where we're very careful. I don't know if I'm going to tell this person, you know, what they're going to think about me or what they're going to say. You know, seek help. Seek professional help. Seek counseling. You know, some of you are very lucky to work in places where you have, you know, um, support systems, EAPs and all that, get on the phone and ask for help. If you're dealing with a situation for a month and it's not changing, don't treat it by yourself. Don't deal with it on your own. Prayer and petition. This is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. Philippians chapter 4. Amen? Philippians chapter 4, and I'm going to take it from verse 4. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Amen, church? He says, whatever trials we're going through, whatever challenges, remember, whatever you're going through is not new, but we've got to go to God. 
He said, present by way of prayers and petition. Now, that's very strong. You know how I petition God? I fast. You know, and when I fast, I'm able to focus on my prayers. You know, this week, I just came back on Friday night. On Wednesday, I was out of town for, for a conference. You know, this is a conference at work we've been planning since March of this year. And it's a big deal because we haven't had one in four years. And this is the first time as, as I lead the team that we're going to organize this. And we had all the items that we're going to do. So we're planning and people are traveling from all my areas. So I cover the eastern and northern Ontario. So people are traveling down from Timmins, from Sudbury, from Sault Ste. Marie, uh, North Bay, and then Eastern Ontario, and we're having this conference in Belleville. Guys, so conference was going to start on Thursday, and on Wednesday morning, so Wednesday evening, the leadership team here, we're going to leave, and then we'll, we'll get there Wednesday night, and then we'll, we'll have a management meeting in the morning and, and take the conference on. Wednesday morning, brothers and sisters, I woke up. You know, sometimes I dream, and I remember my dream, everything. I remember everything I dream about. And sometimes I dream, I remember nothing. And I know I had a dream, and I know it was a scary dream. I woke up, and I know I had a dream. And one thing that I remembered from all, I didn't remember anything, but the last thing I remembered as I got up was, the conference has been canceled. And I'm like, and it kept ringing in my head. So as I got up to do my routines, I, pray, I, did my, I had my prayer, I prayed, did everything. It kept ringing in my head. Why would my conference be... I don't know about you. Maybe it's intuition. Some call it, yeah, maybe it's because something is coming up and you're stressed about it, you're thinking about it. I'm convinced a lot of times that is the Spirit of God. Amen. You know, when we're baptized, we received God's Spirit. And God's Spirit ministers to us in several ways. And when that happened, you know, I was troubled. And I said, you know what, God, I'm going to give it to you. I've been praying about this conference. My wife has been praying about it. I'm going to give it to you. So there and then I decided I'm going to fast for the half, first half of Wednesday morning. Wednesday, I'm going to fast till about noon. And I'd already, the night before, I had my stuff ready for breakfast, so I put everything away, no breakfast. So I fasted till about noon. I prayed at intervals, and I came back. And then after I came back for lunch, went back to the office, got ready. We left. Uh, three of my management team members were traveling with me. We we're going to take the train to Belleville. We got into the taxi. I sat in front. We got to the train station, put my hand in my wallet, in my pocket. I said I was going to pay. I told them I was going to pay. I couldn't find my wallet. I'm like, uh-oh, no wallet. Well, this is going to happen. So I told the other guys, you guys get down. This was about 2.50. It was a 3.30 trade. So I said, you guys get down. I told the taxi driver, take me back to the office. I probably left it in, my, in the pocket of my jacket because I left my jacket in the office. And as we were going back to the office, we got on the highway. Just as we got to Metcalf area, there was a car with a Quebec plate that was in, indecisive. So the cab driver was behind him. He went left, and my, because my, my cab driver was in a hurry now to try to get me to the office. And the guy went right, and then he changed his lane again, and we're all like, what's going on here? So the cab driver pulled to the side of the guy and looked at him. And right away, they recognized, I don't know whether they recognized each other, they knew where they came from. This guy was Arabic, the taxi driver, and he said to him, something to him in Arabic, and that one responded, and the voices were raised, and the other guy crossed us and blocked us out. He was trying to come down for a fight. And I don't know if it's his wife or his girlfriend, she was in front, and she kept screaming at him and telling him, sit down, sit down. And here I am sitting down praying, God, you know I'm not going to miss my train. If a fight happens here, I am not living here because the cops are going to come, and that's it. And I, got, I was praying silently, and somehow... The lady was able to calm him down, and he pulled out, and we got to the office. Anyway, I got my wallet. I got on the train five minutes before takeoff. You know, as we got down, 
something just kept nudging me. And so that evening, I called one of the managers, and I know she's, uh, she's of the faith. She talks about church, she talks about God. And I asked her, I said, can you meet me at the lobby at 8 o'clock to pray? And she said, yes. So we went to the lobby at the restaurant, we sat down, and I said, here are the things I'm concerned about. Because I said, I asked myself, what could make this conference get canceled? If my team traveling from the north gets into an accident and somebody dies, I'm not going to move on with that conference. I'm going to cancel it. If something catastrophic happens, I'm going to cancel it. So I said, let's pray. And so we prayed. We prayed about everybody coming. We prayed about the conference, and we, and we left it. And I felt so much at peace, you know, and I was like, that's it. Thursday morning, we had a management meeting in the hotel. Meeting was going on. Two hours into the meeting, my assistant looked up and said, I just got a message. The boss bringing people from Ottawa broke down. So all the Ottawa team were coming on the bus, broke down. And they're one and a half hour away, half hour away from Belleville. So I said, okay, what do we do? She goes, so she left. Faith and deeds, amen? So she went, picked up the phone, called the bus company, and the company is from Castleman, which is another 45 minutes away, 40 minutes from Ottawa. So they sent another bus, came over. Anyway, got the people there on time. Everybody got on time. The bus they gave us were told the driver had to be back in the hotel by 9 p.m. Because of the cancellation, we got an extension till 11 p.m. Okay? <laughs> and we had, we were on a tight schedule that we didn't know how we were going to be done with the bus by 9. And so, in all this, and as all that was taken up, people came late, we still got on time, and the manager that we prayed together looked at me as the, program, as the, as the event went on at, at break. She came to me and she goes, last night's prayer. I said, yeah, God has it. You know, when you leave things in God's hands, there's a confidence that God gives you. And I don't know what your situation is. Honestly, I don't know how tough your situation is. But when we delegate things to God, we, be, we have to trust God. When you've left everything in God's hands and you worry, it's basically saying, God, here's what I entrusted to you. Give it back to me. God doesn't work that way. Amen? So, prayer and petition, every Saturday the church, you know, the brothers... Uh, I supposed to meet in Benito's, get together and pray with somebody. You know, some people are more blessed in how to pray than others. Some of you can pray for an hour nonstop. Some people are not that good at praying. But I believe the more you pray with people, the better you are. I was a Muslim. I grew up as a Muslim. I had no clue what prayer was. In the mosque, we sat down, we recited verses. You recited verses in Arabic that you didn't even know what it meant. That was how we pray. As a Christian, as a young disciple, I will meet with brothers and we will pray. And I will pick up. And I will pick up. And I will pick up. And that's how I learned to pray. And my wife and I, we pray together every morning. That's how you learn to pray. You know, set up times with brothers and sisters. If there are prayer times happening, go there. Pray. Pray for people and ask for prayers to be said on your behalf. Let's take baby steps, brothers. I know I've shared so many things and many things this morning, but think about something that you were going to change, you're going to do differently this week. Not too many things. One thing that you're going to do differently this week. And it's baby steps. One after the other. Let's take anxiety, stress, worry as an opportunity to grow in our faith so that we can rise up, we can help others, and we can walk in strength with God. The strength to overcome is not yours, is not mine. It is God's. And that power that enables us to overcome comes from him. Amen? God bless you. That's my message this morning.